I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you Lord Thank you Lord For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I cannot see Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name and I thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just wanna thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you've done in my life, you took my darkness and gave me your light. Thank you, Lord. took my sin and shame You took my sickness and healed all my pain Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord With a grateful heart With a song of praise With an outstretched arm I'll bless your name Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just wanna thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just wanna thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name and I thank you, Lord. I just wanna thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just wanna thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Chapter 5, The Pergamean Church Age, Revelation 2, 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Pergamus. Pergamum, ancient name, was situated in Mysia, in a district watered by three rivers, by one of which it communicated to the sea. It was described as the most illustrious city in Asia. It was a city of culture, with a library second only to that in Alexandria. Yet it was a city of great sin, given over to licentious rites of worship of Esculapius, whom they worshipped in the form of a living serpent, which was housed and fed in the temple. In this beautiful city of irrigated groves, public walks, and parks, lived a small group of dedicated believers who were not fooled by the veneer of beauty and abhorred the satanic worship that filled the place. The Age The Pergamean Age lasted about 300 years, from 312 to 606 A.D. The Messenger Using our God-given rule for choosing the messenger to each age, that is, we choose the one whose ministry most closely approximates that of the first messenger, Paul, we unhesitatingly declare the Pergamian messenger to be Martin. Martin was born in 315 in Hungary. However, his life work was in France, where he labored in and around Tours as a bishop. He died in 399. This great saint was the uncle of another wonderful Christian, St. Patrick of Ireland. Martin was converted to Christ while he was following a career as a professional soldier. It was while he was still engaged in this occupation that a most remarkable miracle occurred. It is recorded that a beggar lay sick in the streets of the town where Martin was posted. The winter cold was more than he could bear, for he was poorly clad. No one paid any attention to his needs until Martin came by. Seeing this poor man's plight, but not having an extra garment, he took off his outer cloak, cut it in two with his sword, and wrapped the cloth around the freezing man. He attended him the best he could and went on his way. That night the Lord Jesus appeared unto him in a vision. There he stood like a beggar wrapped in the half of Martin's garment. He spoke to him and said, Martin, though he is only a catechumen, has clothed me with this garment. From that time on Martin sought to serve the Lord with all his heart. His life became a series of miracles manifesting the power of God. After having left the army and having become a leader in the church, he took a very militant stand against idolatry. He cut down the groves broke up the images, and pulled down the altars. When confronted by the pagans for his deeds, he challenged them in much the same manner that Elijah did the prophets of Baal. He offered to be tied to a tree on its underside, so that when it was cut down it would crush him unless God intervened and turned the tree around while it fell. The wily heathen tied him to a tree that was growing on the side of a hill, assured that the natural pull of gravity would cause the tree to so fall as to crush him. Just as the tree began to fall, God swung it around and uphill, contrary to all natural laws. The fleeing heathen were crushed as the tree fell on several of them. Historians acknowledge that on at least three occasions he raised the dead by faith in Jesus' name. In one instance he prayed for a dead baby. Like Elisha, he stretched himself upon the babe and prayed. It came back to life and health. On another occasion he was called to help deliver a brother who was being carried away to his death in a time of great persecution. By the time he arrived, the poor man was already dead. They had hanged him upon a tree. His body was lifeless and his eyes protruded from the sockets.
But Martin took him down, and when he had prayed, the man was restored to life and to his rejoicing family. Martin never did fear the enemy, regardless of who it was. Thus he went to personally face a wicked emperor who was responsible for the death of many spirit-filled saints. The emperor would not grant an audience, so Martin went to see a friend of the emperor, one Damasus, a cruel bishop of Rome. But the bishop, being a nominal Christian of the false vine, would not intercede. Martin went back to the palace, but by now the gates had been locked and they would not allow him to enter. He lay down on his face before the Lord and prayed that he be able to get into the palace. He heard a voice bidding him arise. When he did so, he saw the gates open of their own accord. He walked into the court, but the arrogant ruler would not turn his head and speak to him. Martin again prayed. Suddenly a fire came spontaneously from the seat of the throne, and the unhappy emperor vacated speedily. Surely the Lord humbles the proud and exalts the lowly. Such was his ardor in serving the Lord that the devil was mightily aroused. The enemies of truth hired assassins to kill Martin. They came by stealth to his home, and as they were about to kill him, he stood erect and bared his throat to the sword. As they leaped forward, the power of God suddenly hurled them back across the room. So overcome were they in that holy and fearful atmosphere that they crawled upon their hands and knees and begged forgiveness for the attempt upon his life. Too often when men are signally used of the Lord, they become lifted up with pride. But not so with Martin. He ever remained the humble servant of God. One night, as he was preparing himself to enter the pulpit, a beggar came to his study and asked for some clothing. Martin referred the beggar to his head deacon. The haughty deacon commanded him to leave. Thereupon he went back to see Martin. Martin arose and gave the beggar his own fine robe and bade the deacon bring him another robe which was of lesser quality. That night as Martin preached the word, the flock of God saw a soft white glow of light around his person. Surely this was a great man, a true messenger to that age. Never desirous of aught but to please God, he lived a most consecrated life. Never could he be induced to preach until he had first prayed and was in such spiritual frame as to know and deliver the full counsel of God by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Often he would keep the people waiting while he prayed for full assurance. Just to know about Martin and his mighty ministry might make one think that the persecution of the saints had abated. Not so. They were still being destroyed by the devil through the instrumentality of the wicked. They were burned at the stake. They were nailed to logs face down, and wild dogs were turned loose upon them, so that the dogs would tear away the flesh and bowels, leaving the victims to die in terrible torture. Babes were ripped from expectant mothers and thrown to the hogs. Women's breasts were cut away, and they were forced to stand erect, while each heart throb poured out the blood until they crumpled in death. And the tragedy was even greater to think about when one realizes that this was not solely the work of the heathen, but many times it was caused by so-called Christians who felt that they did God a favor in exterminating these loyal soldiers of the cross who stood for the word and obedience to the Holy Spirit. John 16, 2 They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Matthew 24, 9 Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. By signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit, Martin was truly vindicated as the messenger to that age. But not only was he gifted by a great ministry, he himself was forever true to the word of God. He fought organization. He withstood sin in high places. He championed the truth in word and deed and lived out a full life of Christian victory. A biographer wrote of him on this wise. No one ever saw him angry or disturbed or grieving or laughing. He was always one and the same and seemed something beyond mortal, wearing on his countenance a sort of celestial joy. Never was anything on his lips but Christ, never anything in his heart but piety, peace, and pity. Often did he weep for the sins even of those his detractors, who when he was quiet and absent attacked him with viperous lips and poisoned tongues. Many hated him for virtues they themselves did not possess and could not imitate, and alas, his bitterest assailants were bishops. The Salutation Revelation 2, 12b 
These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with the two edges. The message to the third church age is about to come forth. The third scene of this unfolding drama of Christ in the midst of his church is about to be revealed. With trumpet-like voice the Spirit presents the matchless one. He which hath the sharp sword with the two edges. How vastly different is this presentation from the time when Pilate introduced the Lamb of God, clothed in mocking robes of purple, smitten and thorn-crowned, saying, Behold your king! Now regal-robed and crowned with glory stands the risen Lord, Christ, the power of God. In these words, he which hath the sharp sword with two edges lies another revelation of Godhead. In the Ephesian age, you will recall, he was set forth as the unchanging God. In the Smyrnian age, we saw him as the one true God, and beside him there was no other. Now in this Pergamian age, there is a further revelation of his Godhead, set forth by his association with the sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Ephesians six seventeen, And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Revelation nineteen thirteen and 15a. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same Word was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made which was made. 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now we can see His association with the Word. He is the Word. That is who He is. The Word in His name. In John 1, 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word. The root from which we get our translation for Word is Logos, which means the thought or concept. It has the double meaning of thought and speech. Now a thought expressed is a word or words. Isn't that wonderful and beautiful? John says the concept of God was expressed in Jesus. And Paul says the very same thing in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Logos, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. God became expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the express image of God. Again in John 1, 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The very substance of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. The great Spirit God, under which no man could approach, which no man had seen or could behold, was now tabernacled in flesh and dwelt among men, expressing the fullness of God to men. John 1, 18. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. God, who on occasions would manifest his presence, by the cloud or pillar of fire that struck fear in the hearts of men. This God, whose heart characteristics were made known only by revelation of words through the prophets, now became Emmanuel, God with us, declaring himself. The word declare is taken from the Greek root, which we often interpret as exegesis, which means to thoroughly explain and make clear. That is what the living word, Jesus, did. He brought God to us, for He was God. He revealed God to us with such perfect clarity that John could say about Him in 1 John 1, 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, logos means speech, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. 
For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. When God was truly revealed, he was manifested in the flesh. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now back in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, we made note that Jesus was the express image of God. He was God expressing himself in man to man. But there is something else to note in these verses, especially verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. I want you to notice here in the margin of your Bible you will see a correction. The word by is not a correct translation. It should be in, not by. It then reads correctly, God spake in times past unto the fathers in the prophets by means of the word. 1 Samuel 3, 21b For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. That brings out 1 John 5, 7 perfectly. The Spirit and the Word are one. Jesus revealed the Father. The Word revealed the Father. Jesus was the living Word. Praise God, today He is still that living Word. When Jesus was upon the earth, He said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. John 14.10 here it is most evidently set forth that the perfect manifestation of God in the Son was by the indwelling Spirit manifesting in word and works. That is exactly what we have been teaching all along. When the bride will get back to being a word bride, she will produce the very works that Jesus produced. The Word is God. The Spirit is God. They are all one. One cannot work apart from the other. If one truly has the Spirit of God, he will have the Word of God. That is how it was with the prophets. They had the indwelling Spirit of God, and the Word came to them. That is how it was with Jesus. In Him was the Spirit without measure, and the Word came to Him. Jesus both began to do and teach. My doctrine is not my own, but the Father's that sent me. Acts 1, 1, John 7, 16. Remember now, John the Baptist was both the prophet and the messenger of his day. He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. When he was baptizing in Jordan, the Word of God, Jesus, came to him. The Word always comes to the truly Spirit-filled. That is the evidence of being filled with the Holy Ghost. That is what Jesus said would be the evidence. He said, And I will pray the Father, and he will send you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, now we know what truth is. Thy word is truth. John 17:17b. 17, 17, Again in John 8:43. Why do you not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Did you notice that Jesus said that the world could not receive the Holy Ghost? Well, in this verse I just read, neither could they receive the word. Why? Because the Spirit and the word are one, and if you have the Holy Spirit as the prophets, the word would come to you you would receive it. In John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Here again we find the word coming because of the Spirit of God. Again in John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, word, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Thy word is truth. And he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, word of God, that shall he speak, word, and he will show you things to come. Spirit bringing the word of prophecy. I want you to note very carefully that Jesus did not say that the evidence of being baptized with the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues, interpreting, prophesying, or shouting and dancing. He said the evidence would be that you would be in the truth, you would be in the word of God for your age. Evidence has to do with receiving that word. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, 
If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now see that. The proof of the indwelling spirit was to acknowledge and follow what God's prophet gave for his age as he set the church in order. Paul had to say to those who claimed another revelation, verse 36, What came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? The evidence of a spirit-filled Christian believer is not to produce the truth, word, but to receive the truth, word, and to believe and obey it. Have you noticed in Revelation 22, 17, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. See, the Bride speaks the same word as does the Spirit. She is a word, Bride, proving she has the Spirit. In every church age we hear these words, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Spirit gives the word. If you have the Spirit, you will hear the word for your age, as those true Christians took the word for their age. Did you get that last thought? I repeat, every church age ends with the same admonition. He that hath an ear, let him, an individual, hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. The Spirit gives the word. He has the truth for each age. Each age has had its own elect, and that elect group always heard the word and received it, proving they had the seed in them. John 8:47. And he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. They refuse the word, Jesus, and his words for their days. But the true seed received the word, because they were of God. And all thy children shall be taught of God. Holy Spirit, Isaiah 54:13. Jesus said the same thing in John 6.45. Being one with the word proves whether you are of God and spirit-filled. No other criterion. But what are tongues and interpretation and the other gifts? They are manifestations. That is what the word teaches. Read it in 1 Corinthians 12.7. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Then Paul names those manifestations. Now comes this very good question I know that you are all anxious to ask. Why isn't the manifestation an evidence of being baptized with the Holy Ghost? Because you surely could not manifest the Holy Ghost unless you truly were spirit-filled. Now I wish I could say that is right, because I don't like to hurt people or walk on their doctrine. But I wouldn't be a true servant of God if I didn't tell you the whole counsel of God. That is right, is it not? Just let us take a little look at Balaam. He was religious, he worshipped God. He understood the proper method of sacrificing and approaching unto God. But he was not a true seed prophet, for he took the wages of unrighteousness. And worst of all, he led the people of God into sins of fornication and idolatry. Yet who would dare to deny that the Spirit of God manifested through him in one of the most beautiful portions of absolutely accurate prophecy the world has ever seen? But he never had the Holy Ghost. Now then, what do you think of Caiaphas, the high priest? The Bible says that he prophesied the kind of death the Lord should die. We all know there is no record of him being a spirit-filled and spirit-led man like dear old Simeon or that sweet saint called Anna. Yet he had a genuine manifestation of the Holy Ghost. We can't deny that. So where is manifestation as an evidence? It isn't there. If you are truly filled with the Spirit of God, you will have the evidence of the Word in your life. Let's show you how deeply I feel and understand this truth by a revelation God gave me. Now before I tell it, I want to say this. Many of you people believe me to be a prophet. I don't say that I am. You said it. But we both know that the visions God gives me never fail. Not once. If anyone can prove a vision ever failed, I want to know about it. Now that you follow me this far, here is my story. Many years ago, when I first came across the Pentecostal people, I was in one of their camp meetings where there was much manifestation of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Two preachers in particular were engaged in this kind of speaking more than any of the other brethren. I thoroughly enjoyed the services and was truly interested in the various manifestations, for they had a ring of reality to them. It was my earnest desire to learn all that I could about these gifts, so I decided to talk to the two men about them. Through the gift of God resident in me, I sought to know the spirit in the first man, whether he was truly of God or not. After a brief conversation with that sweet, humble brother, I knew that he was a genuine, solid Christian. He was real. 
The next young man was not at all like the first one. He was boastful and proud, and as I spoke to him a vision moved across my eyes, and I saw that he was married to a blonde lady but was living with a brunette and had two children by her. If ever there was a hypocrite, he was one. Now let me tell you, I was shocked. How could I not be? Here were two men, one of which was a real believer and the other was a sinful impersonator, yet both were manifesting gifts of the Spirit. I was troubled by this confusion. I left the meeting to seek God for the answer. I went alone to a secret place, and there with my Bible I prayed and waited on God for the answer. Not knowing just what portion of Scripture to read, I casually opened the Bible to some place in Matthew. I read for a while and then laid the Bible down. In a moment, a wind blew into the room and turned the pages of the Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. I read it through and was particularly impressed by those strange verses, Hebrews 6, 4 through 9. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. I closed the Bible, laid it down, and meditated a while, and prayed some more. I still had no answer. I again opened the Bible aimlessly, but did not read. Suddenly the wind blew into the room again, and once more the pages turned to Hebrews 6, and remained there as the wind ceased. I read those words over again, and when I did, then came the Spirit of God into the room, and I beheld a vision. I saw in the vision a man dressed in the purest white, who went forth into a freshly plowed field and sowed grain. It was a bright day, and the sowing was done in the morning. But late at night, after the sower in white had gone, a man in black came and stealthily sowed some more seed amongst that which the man in white had sown. The days went by. The sun and rain blessed the ground. And one day there appeared the grain. How fine it was! But a day later appeared the tares. The wheat and tares grew together. They partook of the same nourishment out of the same soil. They drank in the same sun and rain. Then one day the skies turned to brass, and the plants all began to droop and to die. I heard the wheat lift their heads and cry to God for rain. The tares also lifted up their voices and pleaded for rain. Then the skies darkened, and the rain came, and again the wheat, now full of strength, lifted up their voices and cried in adoration, Praise the Lord! And to my wonderment I heard the revived tares also look up and say, Hallelujah! Then I knew the truth of the camp meeting and the vision, the parable of the sower and the seed, the sixth chapter of Hebrews, and the evident manifestation of spiritual gifts in a mixed audience, all became wonderfully clear. The sower in white was the Lord, the sower in black was the devil, the world was the field, the seeds were people, elect and reprobates, both partook of the same nourishment, water and sun. Both prayed. Both received help from God, for he maketh his sun and rain to fall on both good and evil. And though they both had the same wonderful blessing, and both had the same wonderful manifestations, there was still that one great difference. They were of different seed. Here also was the answer to Matthew seven twenty-one through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jesus does not deny that they did the mighty works, that only the Holy Ghost can accomplish by way of men. But he did deny ever knowing them. These weren't backsliders. These were wicked, unregenerate reprobates. These were the seed of Satan. And there it is. You can't claim that manifestation is the evidence of being spirit-born, spirit-filled. No, sir. 
I will admit that true manifestation is the evidence of the Holy Spirit doing mighty acts, but it is not the evidence of the individual being spirit-filled, even though that individual has an abundance of those manifestations. The evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost today is just the same as it was back in the day of our Lord. It is receiving the word of truth for the day in which you live. Jesus never did stress the importance of the works as he did the word. He knew that if the people got the word, the works would follow. That is Bible. Now Jesus knew that there was going to be a terrible drift away from the word in the Pergamean age, which was as yet 200 years off from the Patmos vision. He knew that drift would cause them to go into the dark ages. He knew that the way man originally got away from God was by first leaving the word. If you leave that word, you have left God. Thus he is presenting himself to the church at Pergamos, and indeed to all churches of all ages. I am the word. If you want deity in your midst, then welcome and receive the word. Don't ever let anyone or anything get between you and that word. This which I am giving you, the word, is a revelation of myself. I am the word. Remember that. I wonder if we are sufficiently impressed with the word in our midst. Let me give you a thought here. How do we pray? We pray in Jesus' name, don't we? Every prayer is in his name or there isn't any answer. Yet in 1 John 5, 14, we are told, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now we ask, what is the will of God? There is only one way to know his will, and that is by the word of God. Lamentations 3, 37. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass when the Lord commandeth it not? There it is. If it isn't in the word, you can't have it. So we can't ask unless it's in the word, and we can't petition or ask unless it is in his name. There it is again. Jesus, the name, is the word, will. You can't separate God and the word. They are one. Now then, this word he has left behind on the printed page is a part of him when you accept it by faith into a spirit-filled life. He said that his word was life. John 6, 63b. But that is exactly what he is. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Romans 8, 9b. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. There it is. He is Spirit, and he is life. That is exactly what the Word is. That is exactly what Jesus is. He is the Word. So when a Spirit-born, Spirit-filled man in faith takes that Word into his heart and places it upon his lips, why, that is the same as deity speaking. Every mountain has to go. Satan cannot stand before that man. If the church way back there in that third age had only held on to the revelation of the living word in their midst, the power of God would not have faded as it did in those dark ages. And right today, when the church returns to the word in faith, we can say without doubt that the glory of God and the wonderful acts of God will be in her midst again. One night as I was seeking the Lord, the Holy Spirit told me to pick up my pen and write. As I grasped the pen to write, His Spirit gave me a message for the church. I want to bring it to you. It has to do with the Word and the Bride. Here is what I am trying to say to you. The law of reproduction is that each species brings forth after its own kind, even according to Genesis 1.11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Whatever life was in the seed came forth into a plant and thence into fruit. The very same law applies to the church today. Whatever seed started the church will come forth and be like the original seed, because it is the same seed. In these last days, the true bride church, Christ's seed, will come to the headstone, and she will be the super church, a super race as she nears him. They in the bride will be so much like him that they will even be in his very image. This is in order to be united with him. They will be one. They will be the very manifestation of the word of the living God. Denominations cannot produce this wrong seed. 
They will produce their creeds and their dogmas mixed with the word. This mongrelizing brings forth a hybrid product. The first son, Adam, was the spoken seed word of God. He was given a bride to reproduce himself. That is why the bride was given to him to reproduce himself, to produce another son of God. But she fell. She fell by hybridization. She caused him to die. The second son, Jesus, also a spoken seed word of God, was given a bride like as was Adam. But before he could marry her, she also had fallen. She, like Adam's wife, was put to the test whether she would believe the word of God and live or doubt the word and die. She doubted. She left the word. She died. From a little group of the true seed of the word, God will present Christ with a beloved bride. She is a virgin of his word. She is a virgin because she knows no man-made creeds or dogmas. By and through the members of the bride will be fulfilled all that was promised of God to be made manifest in the virgin. The word of promise came to the Virgin Mary, but that word of promise was He Himself to be made manifest. God was made manifest. He Himself acted at that time and fulfilled His own word of promise in the Virgin. It was an angel that had brought her the message. But the angel's message was the word of God. Isaiah 9, 6. He fulfilled at that time all that was written of him because she accepted his word to her. The members of the virgin bride will love him, and they will have his potentials, for he is their head, and all power belongs to him. They are subject to him as the members of our bodies are subject to our heads. Notice the harmony of the Father and the Son. Jesus never did anything until it was first showed him by the Father. John 5:19. This harmony is now to exist between the groom and his bride. He shows her his word of life. She receives it. She never doubts it. Therefore nothing can harm her, not even death. For if the seed be planted, the water will raise it up again. Here is the secret of this. The word is in the bride, as it was in Mary. The bride has the mind of Christ, for she knows what he wants done with the word. She performs the command of the word in his name, for she has... Thus saith the Lord. Then the word is quickened by the Spirit, and it comes to pass. Like a seed that is planted and watered, it comes to full harvest, serving its purpose. Those in the bride do only His will. No one can make them do otherwise. They have thus saith the Lord, or they keep still. They know that it has to be God in them doing the works, fulfilling His own word. He did not complete all His work while in His earthly ministry, so now he works in and through the bride. She knows that, for it was not yet time for him to do certain things that he must now do. But he will now fulfill through the bride that work which he left for this specific time. Now let us stand like Joshua and Caleb. Our promised land is coming in sight even as theirs did. Now Joshua means Jehovah Savior, and he represents the end-time leader that will come to the church even as Paul came as the original leader. Caleb represents those that stayed true with Joshua. Remember, God had started Israel as a virgin with His word. But they wanted something different. So did the last day church. Notice how God did not move Israel, or let her go into the promised land until it was His own appointed time. Now the people might have put pressure on Joshua, their leader, and said, The land is ours. Let's go and take it. Joshua, you are all through. You must have lost your commission. You don't have the power you used to have. You used to hear from God and know the will of God and act quickly. Something is wrong with you. But Joshua was a God-sent prophet, and he knew the promises of God. So he waited for them. He waited for a clear-cut decision from God, and when the time came to move, God placed the full leadership in Joshua's hands, because he had stayed with the word. God could trust Joshua, but not the others. So it will repeat in this end day. The same problem, the same pressures. Take the example we see in Moses. This mighty anointed prophet of God had a peculiar birth, being born at the right time for the deliverance of Abraham's seed from Egypt. He never stayed in Egypt to argue scripture with them, nor fuss at the priests. He went to the wilderness until the people were ready to receive him. God called Moses to the wilderness. The waiting was not on Moses' part, but because of the people who were not ready to receive him. Moses thought the people would understand, 
but they did not. Then there is Elijah, to whom the word of the Lord came. When he got through preaching the truth, and that group back there, that is the forerunner of the American Jezebel group, would not receive the word, God called him off the field and plagued that generation for rejecting the prophet and the message that God had given. God called him to the wilderness, and he would not come out even for the king. Those who tried to persuade him to do so died. But God spoke to his faithful prophet by vision. Out of hiding he came and brought back the word to Israel. Then came John the Baptist, Christ's faithful forerunner, the mighty prophet for his day. He did not go to his father's school, nor the school of the Pharisees. He went to no denomination, but out to the wilderness called there by God. There he stayed until the Lord sent him out with the message, crying, The Messiah is at hand. Now let us take a scriptural warning here. Was it not in the days of Moses, whom God had vindicated, that Korah rose up and withstood that mighty prophet? He disputed with Moses and claimed that he had as much from God to lead the people, and that others shared in the divine revelation as well as did Moses. He denied the authority of Moses. Now the people back there, after they had heard the true word and were well acquainted with the fact that a true prophet was vindicated of God, I say those people fell for Korah and his gainsayings. Korah was not a scriptural prophet, but the people in great numbers with their leaders went for him. How like the evangelists today with their golden calf schemes like Korah's. They look good to the people as Korah looked good then. They have blood on their foreheads, oil on their hands, and balls of fire on the platform. They allow women preachers, let women cut their hair, wear slacks and shorts, and bypass the word of God for their own creeds and dogmas. That shows what kind of seed is in them. But not all the people turned on Moses and left the word of God. No, the elect stayed with him. The same is happening again today. Many are leaving the word, but some are staying with it. But remember the parable of the wheat and tares. The tares have to be bundled for burning. These apostate churches are getting bound closer and closer together, ready for the fires of God's judgment. But the wheat is going to be gathered to the master. Now I want you to be very careful here and see this. God has promised that at the end time, Malachi 4 is going to be fulfilled. It has to be, for it is the spirit-quickened word of God spoken by the prophet Malachi. Jesus referred to it. It is just before Christ comes the second time. By the time Jesus comes, all scripture must be fulfilled. The Gentile dispensation will be in its last church age when that messenger of Malachi comes. He will be right with the word. He will take the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He will start at the serpent seed and carry on to the messenger in the latter reign but he will be rejected by the denominations. He has to be, for that is history repeating itself from the time of Ahab. Israel's history under Ahab is happening right here in America, where the prophet of Malachi appears. As Israel left Egypt to worship in freedom, pushed out the natives, raised up a nation with great leaders like David, etc., and then put an Ahab on the throne with a Jezebel behind him to direct, so have we done the very same in America. Our forefathers left for this land to worship and live in freedom. They pushed back the natives and took over the land. Mighty men like Washington and Lincoln were raised up, but after a while other men of such poor caliber succeeded these worthy men that soon an Ahab was set in the presidential chair with a Jezebel behind him to direct him. It is at such a time as this that the messenger of Malachi must come. Then in the latter reign will come a Mount Carmel showdown. Watch this carefully now, to see it in the Word. John was the forerunner of Malachi III. He planted the former reign and was rejected by the organizations of his day. Jesus came and had a Mount Transfiguration showdown. The second forerunner of Christ will sow for the latter reign. Jesus will be the showdown between the denominations and creeds, for he will come to back up his word and take his bride in the rapture. The first showdown was Mount Carmel. The second was the Mount Transfiguration, and the third will be Mount Zion. The strange behavior of Moses, Elijah, and John withdrawing from the people into seclusion left many confused. They did not realize that it was because their messages had been rejected. But the seed had been sown, the planting was over. Judgment was next. They had served their purpose as a sign to the people, so judgment was next. 
I believe according to Revelation 13, 16, that the bride will have to stop preaching for the beast is demanding the mark in the hand or forehead, if permission to preach be granted. Denominations will take the mark or be forced to quit preaching. Then the Lamb will come for his bride and judge the great harlot. Now remember that Moses was born for a certain work, but he could not do that work until he had received the gifts which would enable him to do the work. He had to go out in the desert and wait there. God had an appointed time. There was to be a certain Pharaoh on the throne, and the people had to be crying for the bread of life before God could send him back. This is true for our day. But what do we have in this our day? Multitudes are working signs until we have a generation of sign-seekers that know little or nothing about the Word, or a true move of the Spirit of God. If they see blood, oil, and fire, they are happy. It matters not what is in the Word. They will support any sign, even unscriptural ones. But God has warned us about that. He said in Matthew 24, that in the last days the two spirits would be so close together that only the very elect could tell them apart, for they alone would not be deceived. How can you tell the spirits apart? Just give them the word test. If they don't speak that word, they are of the evil one. As the evil one deceived the first two brides, he will try to deceive the bride of this last day by trying to get her to hybridize herself through creeds or just plainly turning from the word to any sign that suits her. But God never placed signs ahead of the word. Signs follow the word as when Elijah told the woman to bake a cake for him first, according to the word of the Lord. When she did as the word said, the proper sign came. Come to the word first and then watch the miracle. The seed word is energized by the Spirit. How can any messenger sent from God believe only a part of the word and deny some of it? The true prophet of God in this last day will proclaim the whole word. Denominations will hate him. His words may be as harsh as John the Baptist who called them vipers. But the predestinated will hear and be ready for the rapture. The royal seed of Abraham with like faith as Abraham's will hold to the word with him for they are predestinated together. The last day messenger will appear in God's appointed time. It is the end time now, as all know, for Israel is in the homeland. Any time now he will come according to Malachi. When we see him, he will be dedicated to the word. He will be indicated, pointed out in the word, Revelations 10, 7, and God will vindicate his ministry. He will preach the truth as did Elijah and be ready for the Mount Zion showdown. Many will misunderstand him because they have been taught Scripture in a certain way which they consider truth. When he comes against that, they will not believe. Even some true ministers will misunderstand the messenger because so much has been called God's truth by deceivers. But this prophet will come, and as the forerunner to the first coming cried, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Even so will he no doubt cry out, Behold the Lamb of God coming in glory. He will do this, for even as John was the messenger of truth to the elect, so is this one the last messenger to the elect and word-born bride. Christ eulogizes the church. Revelation 2.13 I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. I know thy works. These are the identical words uttered to each of the seven messengers relative to the people of God in each age. As they are spoken to the two vines, true and false, they will bring joy and gladness to the hearts of one group, but they ought to strike terror in the hearts of the other. For though we are saved by grace apart from works, true salvation will bring forth works or deeds that will please God. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth, worketh, righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. If this verse means anything at all, it means that what a man does, he is. James 3, 11. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Romans 6, 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Matthew 12:33 through 35 
Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Now if a man is born of the word, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth for ever, 1 Peter 1, 23, he will produce the word. The fruit or works of his life will be a product of the kind of seed of life that is in him. His works, therefore, will be scriptural. Oh, what an indictment this truth is going to be against the Pergamian age. There stands that matchless one, and in his hand, the sharp sword with the two edges, the word of God. And that word will judge us in the last day. In fact, the word is judging even now, for it is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It cuts asunder the carnal from the spiritual. It makes us living epistles read and known of all men to the glory of God. I know thy works. If a man fears that he might not please God, then let him fulfill the word. If a man wonders if he will hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Let him fulfill the word of God in his life, and assuredly he will hear those words of praise. The word of truth was the criterion then. It is the criterion now. There isn't another standard. There isn't another plumb line. As the world is going to be judged by one Christ Jesus, even so it is going to be judged by the Word. If a man wants to know how he is making out, let him do as James suggested. Look into the mirror of God's Word. I know thy works. As he stood there with the Word, examining their lives and the light of the blueprint he had laid out for them, he must have been pleased in a goodly measure, for they, like the others who had gone on before, were enduring the persecution of the unjust, and still joyfully cleaving unto the Lord. Difficult though it was at times to serve the Lord, yet they served Him and worshipped Him in spirit and in truth. But with the false vine it was not so. Alas, they had repudiated the life that is built upon the Word, and were now going further and further away from the truth. Their actions bore witness to the depths to which they had sunk. Thou holdest fast my name. To whom can we go? Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. They held fast then, they were holding fast now, but not with fatalistic dread as men who live out barren lives. They were holding fast in His strength, in the assurance of the Spirit that they were one in Him. Theirs was the sure knowledge of sins forgiven, and they bore the name of Christian in testimony to it. They knew and loved that name that was above every name. Their knees had bowed to that name. Their tongues had confessed to it. Whatsoever they did, they did it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had named that name and departed from evil, and having taken their stand, they were now prepared to die for that name, being assured of a better resurrection. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, O oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Already in the second century those words, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, had spelled out Trinity to many, and the polytheistic idea of three gods had become a doctrine in the false church. It would not be long until the name was taken away as indeed it was in this age, and in its stead the titles of the one great God would be substituted for the name, Lord Jesus Christ. While the many apostatized and embraced a trinity, and baptized using the titles of Godhead, the little flock still baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and so held to the truth. With so many dishonoring God, turning Him into three gods, and changing His gracious name to titles, one would wonder if the signs and wonders that attend such a great name would still be visited amongst the people. Indeed, those signs were mightily and wonderfully manifested, though certainly not in the false vine. Men like Martin were greatly used, and God bore them witness, both by signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Ghost. That name was still effectual, as it always has been and ever will be, where the saints honor Him through the word and faith. Thou hast not denied my faith. In Acts 3.16,
when Peter was asked how the mighty miracle had taken place upon the crippled one at the gate beautiful. He explained it on this wise, And his, Jesus, name, through faith in his, Jesus, name, hath made this man, former cripple, strong. Yea, the faith which is by, from him, Jesus, hath given him, the man, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. See, there it is. Jesus' name and Jesus' faith brought about the miracle. Peter did not claim it was his own human faith any more than he claimed that it was his own name. He said that Jesus' name used in the faith which is from Jesus performed that great work. This faith is what the Lord was speaking about in Revelation 2, 13. It was His faith. It was not faith in Him, but it was His own faith that He had given to the believers. Romans 12, 3. According as God hath dealt to every man, according to verse 1, the men are brethren, the measure of faith. Ephesians 2, 8. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that faith not of yourself. It is a gift of God. And it also says in James 2, 1, My brethren, notice he too is talking to brethren, have not the faith of, not in, our Lord Jesus Christ with respect of persons. In this Pergamian age where men were humanizing salvation, having turned from the truth that salvation is of the Lord, having cast aside the doctrine of election and opened wide the church door and their fellowship to any and all who subscribe to their tenets, never mind the word, in this age of rapid degradation, there were still the few who had the measure of that faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and not only used that faith in acts of power, but withstood those who dared to say that they were saved simply on the grounds of joining a church. They knew that no man could truly believe unto eternal life and the righteousness of God apart from the measure of the faith of the Lord Jesus Himself. As today's church is filled with mental believers who endorse the virgin birth, the shed blood, going to church and taking communion, and are not reborn at all, even so in that third age was the same problem. Human faith wasn't enough then, and it is not enough now. It takes the very faith of the Son of God to drop into a man's heart so that he can receive the Lord of glory into the temple not made with hands. This was a living faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Paul did not say that he lived by faith in the Son of God. It was the faith of the Son of God that had given him life and kept him living in Christian victory. No, they had not denied that salvation was supernatural from start to finish. They kept alive the truth of his name and his faith and they were blessed by the Lord and accounted worthy of Him. Antipas, my faithful martyr. There is no other record in the Word or in any profane history concerning this brother, but surely there need not be. It is more than enough that he was foreknown and known of the Lord. It is more than enough to see his faithfulness unto the Lord recorded in the living Word. He was a Christian. He had the name of Jesus. He had the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he was amongst those who lived by it. He had responded to the words of James, Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with respect of persons. Full of the Holy Ghost and faith as was Stephen, he respected no one, he feared no one. And when death was pronounced upon all who would take that name and walk in the faith of Jesus Christ, he took his stand with those who would not turn back. Yes, he died, but like Abel, he obtained a witness from God. His name is written in the Word. And though dead, his voice still speaks in the pages of God's divine record. Another faithful martyr was carried to his rest. But Satan did not triumph then, even as he did not triumph when he killed the Prince of Peace. For as Satan was despoiled at the cross, even so now will the blood of Antipas cry out to hundreds more who will take up their crosses and follow him. Where Satan's Seat Is the reason that this is part of the eulogy of the Spirit is because these brave soldiers of the cross were overcoming Satan right in the midst of his own throne room. They were winning the battle through the name and faith of Jesus right in the camp of the leaders of darkness. What a tremendous commendation! Like the mighty men of David who invaded the camp of the enemy to bring David thirst-quenching water, so these giants of faith invaded the realm of Satan's earthly stronghold. And by preaching and exhorting, brought the water of salvation to those who lived under the shadow of death. 
Now as much as these words concerning the throne and realm of Satan are a part of God's praise for his elect, they actually set the stage for the denouncement of the evil that has gained supremacy in the church. Pergamos, Satan's throne and dwelling place. To many these phrases have been merely pictorial rather than truly historical. But they are surely real, and history bears that out. Pergamos was indeed the throne and dwelling place of Satan. It happened on this wise. Pergamos was not originally the place where Satan, as concerning human affairs, dwelt. Babylon has always been literally and figuratively his headquarters. It was in the city of Babylon that satanic worship had its origin. Genesis 10, 8 through 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalneh, in the land of Shinar. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. And the whole earth was of one language, and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Babel is the original name for Babylon. It means confusion. It was literally started by Cush, the son of Ham, but was brought to a kingdom of power and grandeur under his son Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Nimrod, according to the Genesis 11 account and also according to profane history, set out to accomplish three things. He wanted to build a strong nation, which he did. He wanted to propagate his own religion, which he did. He wanted to make a name for himself, which he also accomplished. His accomplishments were so monumental that the kingdom of Babylon was called the head of gold amongst all world governments. That his religion gained prominence is proven by the fact that Scripture identifies it with Satan completely in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Revelation chapters 17 through 18. And by history we can prove that it invaded the whole world and is the basis for every system of idolatry and the theme of mythology though the names of the gods differ in various sections of the land according to the language of the people. That he made a name for himself and his followers goes without saying. For as long as this present age goes on, until Jesus reveals himself to his brethren, he will be worshipped and honored, though under a different name from Nimrod, and in a temple slightly different from the one in which he was originally adored. Since the Bible does not deal in the histories of other nations in detail, it will be necessary to search the ancient profane records to find our answer as to how Pergamos became the seat of the satanic religion of Babylon. The major sources of information will be in records of Egyptian and Grecian culture. The reason for this is that Egypt received her science and mathematics from the Chaldeans, and in turn Greece received them from Egypt. Now since the priests were in charge of teaching these sciences, and since these sciences were used as a part of religion, we already know the key as to how the Babylonish religion gained its strength in these two countries. It is also true that whenever a nation was able to overcome another nation, in due time the religion of the subduer became the religion of the subdued. It is well known that the Greeks had the very same signs of the zodiac as did the Babylonians, and it has been found in the ancient Egyptian records that the Egyptians gave the Greeks their knowledge of polytheism. Thus the mysteries of Babylon spread from nation to nation until it appeared in Rome, in China, India, and even in both North and South America we find the very same basic worship. The ancient histories agree with the Bible that this Babylonish religion was most certainly not the original religion of Earth's early peoples. It was the first to drift away from the original faith, but it was not itself the original one. Historians such as Wilkinson and Mallet 
have proven conclusively from the ancient documents that at one time all the peoples of the earth believed in one God, supreme, eternal, invisible, who by the word of his mouth spoke all things into existence, and that in his character he was loving and good and just. But as Satan will always corrupt whatever he can, we find him corrupting the minds and hearts of men so that they reject the truth. As he has always attempted to receive worship, as though he were God and not the servant and creation of God, he drew worship away from God to the end that he might draw it unto himself and so be exalted. He certainly did accomplish his desire to spread his religion throughout the whole world. This is authenticated by God in the book of Romans. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God until they became vain in their imaginations, and through darkness of heart accepted a corrupted religion to the extent that they worshipped creatures and not the Creator. Remember, Satan was a creature of God, son of the morning. Thus we find that where once truth was disseminated amongst men, and all held to that one truth, there later came a day when a vast group turned from God and spread a diabolical form of worship around the world. History bears it out that those of the tribe of Shem that stood with the unchanging truth were in solid opposition to those of Ham who turned away from truth to the devil's lie. There is no time to engage in a discussion of this. It is merely introduced that you may see there were two religions and two only, and the evil one became worldwide. Monotheism turned to polytheism in Babylon. The devil's lie and the devil's mysteries rose up against the truth of God and the mysteries of God in that city. Satan truly became the god of this world and exacted worship from those that he had duped, causing them to believe that he was truly the Lord. The polytheistic religion of the enemy began with the Trinitarian doctrine. It was way back there in antiquity that the one God in three persons idea came into existence. How strange that our modern theologians have not spotted this, but evidently just as duped by Satan as their forebears were, they still believe in three persons in the Godhead. Let us be shown just one place in Scripture where there is any authority for that doctrine. Is it not strange that while the descendants of Ham went on their way in satanic worship, which involved a basic concept of three gods, that there is not one trace of the descendants of Shem believing such a thing, or having any ceremonial worship that involved even a type of it? It is not strange that the Hebrews believed, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. If there were three persons in the Godhead, Abraham, the descendant of Shem, in Genesis 18, saw only one God with two angels. Now how was this trinity expressed? It was expressed by an equilateral triangle, even as it is expressed in Rome today. Strange, the Hebrews did not have such a concept. Now who is right? Is it the Hebrews or the Babylonians? In Asia, the polytheistic idea of three gods in one came out in an image with three heads on one body. He is expressed as three intelligences, in India, they found it in their hearts to express him as one God in three forms. Now that really is good modern-day theology. In Japan, there is a great Buddha with three heads like the one we previously described. But the most revealing of all is that which sets forth the Trinitarian concept of God in a triune form of 1. The head of an old man symbolizing God the Father. 2. A circle which in the mysteries signified seed, which in turn means the Son. 3. The wings and tail of a bird, dove. Here was the doctrine of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three persons in the Godhead, a veritable trinity. You can see the same thing in Rome. Now let me ask once again, is it not strange that the devil and his worshippers actually had more truth revealed than the father of faith, Abraham, and his descendants? Is it not strange that the worshippers of Satan knew more about God than the children of God? Now that is what modern theologians try to tell us when they talk about a trinity. Just remember this one thing from now on. These records are facts, and this is a fact. Satan is a liar and the father of lies, and whenever he comes with any light, it is still a lie. He is a murderer, and his doctrine of the trinity has destroyed the multitudes and will destroy until Jesus comes. According to history, it did not take long for a change to be made in this concept of a father and a son and the Holy Ghost. Satan took them a step at a time away from the truth. The evolved concept of deity was now, one, the eternal father, two, the spirit of God incarnate in a human mother. Does that make you think? Three, 
a divine son, the fruit of that incarnation, woman's seed. But the devil is not content. He hasn't achieved worship of himself yet, except in an indirect way. So he takes the people away from the truth still further. Through his mysteries, he reveals to the people that since the great invisible Father God does not concern himself in the affairs of men, but remains silent relative to them, then it follows that he may well be worshipped in silence. Actually, it means to ignore him as much as possible, if not altogether. This doctrine spread around the world also. And right today in India, you can see that temples to the great creator, the silent God, are strikingly few in number. Since it was not necessary to worship the creator father, it was only natural that worship swung to the mother and child as the objects of adoration. In Egypt, there was the same combination of mother and son called Isis and Osiris. In India, it was Ishai and Ishwara. Note the similarity of names, even. In Asia, it was Sibylle and Dioeus. In Rome and in Greece, it followed suit, and in China. Well, imagine the surprise of some Roman Catholic missionaries as they entered China and found there a Madonna and child with rays of light emanating from the head of the babe. The image could well have been exchanged for one in the Vatican except for the difference of certain facial features. It now behooves us to discover the original mother and child. The original goddess mother of Babylon was Semiramis, who was called Rhea in the eastern countries. In her arms she held a son who, though a babe, was described as tall, strong, handsome, and especially captivating to the women. In Ezekiel 8.14 he was called Tammuz. Among classical writers he was called Bacchus. To the Babylonians he was Ninus. What accounts for the fact that he is represented as a babe in arms, and yet described as a great and mighty man, is that he is known as the husband son. One of his titles was Husband of the Mother. And in India, where the two are known as Ishwara and Ishai, he, the husband, is represented as the babe at the breast of his own wife. That this Ninus is the Nimrod of the Bible, we can affirm by comparing history with the Genesis account. Pompeius said, Ninus, king of Assyria, changed the ancient moderate ways of life by the desire for conquest. He was the first who carried war against his neighbors. He conquered all nations from Assyria to Libya, as these men knew not the arts of war. Diodorus says, Ninus was the most ancient of Assyrian kings mentioned in history. Being of warlike disposition, he trained many young men rigorously in the arts of war. He brought Babylonia under him, while yet there was no city of Babylon. Thus we see this Ninus started to become great in Babylon, built Babel and took over Assyria, becoming its king, and then proceeded to devour other vast territories where the people were unskilled in war and lived in a moderate way, as said Pompeius. Now in Genesis 10, speaking of the kingdom of Nimrod, it says, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Aser, and builded Nineveh, and Kela, etc. But the translators made a mistake in translating Aser as a noun, for it is a verb, and in the Chaldee means to make strong. Thus it is Nimrod who, having been made strong, he established his kingdom by building the world's first army, which he trained by drilling and through the rigors of hunting, went beyond Shinar with his strong army and subdued nations and built such cities as Nineveh, which was named after him. For even today a chief part of the ruins of that city is called Nimrud. Since we have discovered who Ninus was, it is now necessary to discover who his father was. According to history, it was Bel, the founder of Babylon. Now it is to be noted here that Bel founded it in the sense that he started this whole move, but it was the son, Ninus, that established it and was the first king, etc. But according to the scripture, the father of Nimrod was Cush, and Cush begat Nimrod. Not only is this so, but we find that Ham begat Cush. Now in the Egyptian culture, Bel was called Hermes and Hermes means the son of Ham. According to history, Hermes was the great prophet of idolatry. He was the interpreter of the gods. Another name by which he was called was Mercury. Read Acts 14, 11 through 12. Hygina says this about that god who was known variously as Bel, Hermes, Mercury, etc. For many ages men lived under the government of Jove. Not the Roman Jove, but Jehovah of the Hebrews, who predates Roman history. 
without cities and without laws, and all speaking one language. But after that, Mercury, Bell, Cush, interpreted the speeches of men, whence an interpreter is called Hermenutes. The same individual distributed the nations. Then discord began. It is seen from this that Bell, or Cush, the father of Nimrod, originally was the ringleader that led the people away from the true God and encouraged the people as the interpreter of the gods to take another form of religion. He encouraged them to go ahead with the tower which his son actually built. This encouragement is what brought the confusion and the division of men, so that he was both interpreter and confuser. Cush then was the father of the polytheistic system, and when men were deified by men, he, of course, became the father of the gods. Now Cush was called Bel, and Bel in Roman mythology was Janus. He is pictured as having two faces, and he carried a club by which he confounded and scattered the people. Ovid writes that Janus said concerning himself, The ancients called me Chaos. Thus we find that the Cush of the Bible, the original rebel against monotheism, was called Bel, Belus, Hermes, Janus, etc., amongst the ancient peoples. He purported to bring revelations and interpretations from the gods to the people. In so doing, he caused the wrath of God to scatter the people, bringing division and confusion. Now up to this point, we have seen whence polytheism, or the worship of many gods, came. But did you notice that we also found a mention of a man named Cush who was given a title of the father of the gods? Did you notice here the old theme of ancient mythologies, that gods identify themselves with men? That is where ancestor worship comes from. So we might just examine history to find out about ancestor worship. Well, it was brought out that Cush introduced a three-god worship of father, son, and spirit. Three gods who were all equal. But he knew about the seed of the woman coming, so there would have to be a woman and her seed come into the picture. This was brought to pass when Nimrod died. His wife, Semiramis, deified him and thus made herself the mother of the son and also the mother of the gods, just exactly as the Roman church has deified Mary. They claim she was without sin and was the mother of God. She, Semiramis, called Nimrod Zeroashta, which means the woman's promised seed. But it wasn't too long until the woman began to attract more attention than the son, and soon she was the one who was depicted as trampling underfoot the serpent. They called her the Queen of the Heaven and made her divine. How like today, wherein Mary, the mother of Jesus, had been elevated to immortality, and right now, as of September 1964, the Vatican Council is attempting to give a quality to Mary she does not possess, for they would like to call her Mary the Mediatrix, Mary the Mother of all believers, or Mother of the Church. If there was ever Babylonish ancestor worship in a religion, it is the religion of the Church of Rome. Not only was ancestor worship originated in Babylon, but so also was the worship of nature. It was in Babylon the gods were identified with the sun and moon, etc. The chief object in nature was the sun, which has light-giving and heat-giving properties, and appears to man as a ball of fire in the heavens. Thus the chief god would be the sun god, whom they called Baal. Often the sun was depicted as a circle of flame, and soon around that flame there appeared a serpent. It wasn't long until the serpent became a symbol of the sun, and consequently worshipped. Thus the desire of Satan's heart became full-fledged. He was worshipped as God. His throne was established. His slaves bowed to him. There in Pergamos, in the form of a living serpent, he was worshipped. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now symbolized in the form of a living serpent, had not only seduced Eve, but the majority of mankind. But how did Pergamos become the seat of Satan if Babylon was the seat? The answer again is in history. When Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians, the priest king Attalus fled the city and went to Pergamos with his priests and sacred mysteries. There he set up his kingdom outside the Roman Empire and thrived under the care of the devil. This has been a very short resume of the history of the Babylonish religion and its advent to Pergamos. Many questions are no doubt left unanswered, and much more, no doubt, could have been said to enlighten us. But this is not intended to be a study of history. Rather, it is intended to be a help to the study of the Word.
brought me back to the provided way. Thank you. Oh, 
provided way. We thank you. Great. 